Tonight, we have Dr. Pamela Weibel. Um, she's here to talk to us about the adventures of setting up a solo practice and how you can actually still be a happy solo practitioner. Um, unlike many of the uh, stories that we've been told by quite a few of our mentors over the last several years, uh, I'm sure you've read about many of them. I happen to know Dr. Weibel. Um, I've been following her for several years now. Um, I've followed her in her uh, adventure to address um, the institution of medicine itself and its profound effect on both students and doctors. Um, she lectured here last year around this time uh, on that very topic. And we're happy to have her here again tonight for the topic that I just talked about. So without any further ado, Dr. Michael. Thank you. So I was told there would be there would be less people here. So I, I don't know if everyone got a book, but I found two more in my car. Um, so Pet Goats and Pap Smears is a book that I wrote in 2012 to help medical students be inspired. It's kind of like chicken soup for the soul for medical students. So if there are more people who did not get a copy of the book, I will just send them this way. And um, if anyone else wants a copy, just contact me afterwards. Leave your phone number on the list and email. Okay, so I have been asked to share some of my perspectives on solo practice and that's got to be my favorite topic and so I think I'm just going to read straight from the email that Jay sent me which and then I'm going to answer I'm really fond of just directly answering questions so if you have any questions that come up feel free to write them down on little scraps of paper that I've sent around or you know just go ahead and um, raise your hand and I can ask I can answer questions questions as I go through here and then we'll have like a lot of Q&A at the end because again my my objective is to leave everyone with all your questions answered so straight from the email many of my colleagues especially those interested in practicing in rural areas would love to hear your insights on how we might shape both our training and our professional expectations for the future so that we, we may serve the people in our communities with an emphasis on the rewards found in personal interaction rather than those of efficient production so there are three things that I pulled out of that paragraph that I think are pretty essential to discuss right now and one is the personal interaction rather than those of efficient production. Another way of saying that is relationship-driven versus production-driven medicine, and that's a term that everyone should be familiar with because you will end up working in one or the other. There's not really much of a middle ground. Either you're going to work, and if you're a third year and you've been exposed to clinics, um, or if you've even volunteered as a first or second year, you will know if you're in a production-driven practice because everyone's very concerned Concerned about like no show rates and numbers on the schedule and how much time and you're spending in a room and when you can get the, to the door soonest and um, leaving patients you know just you can only answer one or two questions and telling them to reschedule if they have like a third question so that is a production driven practice and a relationship driven practice which is what I'm in which is what I think healthcare should be for everyone is basically where the relationship drives your day. You're so energized by the deep relationships that you're creating with your patients and the healing that's coming out of those relationships that you're not really focusing on numbers of patients per day. And you, you're, you're feeling not rushed, you know, I have 30 to 60 minute appointments with my patients versus, you know, seven minute visits and double booking and triple booking and all of that. So it sounds like you all would like to know how to do the relationship driven model which I think is the healthier way to practice. Another term that I sometimes use for production driven is assembly line medicine. So I don't think anyone signed up for medical school to get involved in an assembly line medicine career. And so I would like to drive home the point that you don't have to do that even though many of your mentors might be practicing assembly line medicine that's not the only way to practice medicine and I feel like that really isn't consistent with healthcare. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. 
and I would like to encourage you all to think about diving into relationship-driven medicine, which is pretty much the old style, like pre-1965, when people had the doctors in their neighborhoods and the Marcus Welby sort of thing, if you remember that. <laughs> so, uh, or you can look online on YouTube and look those <laughs> old reruns. It's even before me, really, but, um, but people still talk about it. You know, when I talk to patients, they tell me that's what they want, is the house calls and the Marcus Welby type of neighborhood doctor. And I think that's what you all probably wanted when you um, signed up for medical school. So the other thing I pull out of that paragraph there is serve the people in our communities. So in order to serve people in your community, it's really important to know what they want. So you could have like a really cool idea of what you want to deliver, and if you just hang a shingle and deliver that, you might not be delivering what they want. You might be forcing them onto an algorithm that they don't understand and have um, really no respect for, and it wasn't even what they were looking for when they came in. So it's really important, and I, I drive this home in my book and the way I practice medicine, and I'll tell you how I developed that. It's very important to ask the community what they want and to ask your patients what they actually want from you instead of just holding them hostage to what you think they need to have because that is like a setup for non-compliance when you put yourself in charge of what you think they better do. And so, uh, and not only does that create a scenario where they're probably not going to follow your instructions and they might start to lose respect for you, but you might, and I don't know if you've ever felt this way being in an exam room, you might feel like you're in an invisible tug of war, you know, where like you're trying to pull them onto an al algorithm or something that you think they need to be on based on what the electronic medical record tells you you're supposed to ask next or something, and then what they really came in for, totally different. And it's just a setup for a completely frustrating life as a physician, and it's a setup for, um, for just, um, yeah, not having great outcomes on your patients, and uh, I, I don't think that's what you want either when you signed up for medical school. So I will tell you um, a way that I was able to determine what my patients want and what my community wanted before I opened my practice. And then the other one that I pulled out of that paragraph is how we might shape both our training and our professional expectations for the future. And a really great way to shape your training is by aligning yourself with mentors who you respect, who look like they are having fun practicing medicine, who are successful as doctors. You know, um, you can spend a lot of time with cynics and naysayers and people who will tell you your dreams are impractical and they can never come true and maybe they're just projecting because their dreams never came true in medicine and I think it's really important for you to meet people whose dreams have come true as physicians who are happy and successful in their practices because if that's who you ultimately want to be I think that's who you ultimately need to hang out with right because you can hang out with people who've never practiced medicine who just teach you know maybe basic sciences if that's what you want to do in the future then hang out with people who teach basic sciences if you want to be an actual doctor hands-on with patients, then you need to meet, need to meet hands-on you know, pediatricians or family doctors or gynecologists or whoever it is that you would like to be when you grow up, right? If you can't, there is a possibility that you can't find somebody practicing exactly the way that you imagine that you might want to practice one day. Find other people maybe outside of your specialty. So if you want to go into pediatrics and you can't really find a really happy pediatrician in Lebanon, on, maybe hang out with a happy family doc or a happy um, or come to Eugene and visit me or I can tell you other people around this area that you might want to do rotations with or spend an afternoon with for example so I think when you start to do that you will be that much closer to becoming that type of doctor and also these people are a wealth of information and so so yeah another thing that would be fun to do I've been recommending this for people in my teleseminars and my retreats is hanging out with people who are, even, who are outside of the industry of medicine. So say there's like a successful coffee shop in Lebanon or like a bookstore that's like really doing well, you know, when all un independent bookstores are going out of business, there's one that's thriving. It'd be cool for you to hang out with the business owners of businesses that are doing really well so you can learn from them 
um, what is it that you're doing that makes you so successful? So again, hanging out with successful people, aligning yourself with people who are practicing the way that you want to practice. And so I thought I would just share my story with you and I'm just totally all about being raw and honest and giving you like the full dose of who I am and what medical school was like for me. So I'm not going to hold back. But basically my first year of medical school was the worst year of my entire life. And I've lived 47 years now on the planet and I can continue to say that it was the worst year of my life. Well, I spent most of my time crying into my pillow at night. I felt like disconnected from humanity. I felt like I was watching my classmates have the souls removed from their body like in a dehumanization a cult thing. Um, it was really weird. It was not human. It was not normal. And um, reading my diaries from medical school, I feel like it's like reading the diary of somebody in a concentration camp or in like, I don't know, prisoner of war. I don't know. It's very strange. And um, it wasn't at all what I had imagined. I knew it was going to be hard going to medical school, of course. It's like you, you, have, to, you have to consume a lot of um, information and be able to pass your tests. And, you know, it's not like I wasn't used to doing hard work. I um, was totally prepared for that. I just wasn't prepared for the inhumanity of it. And it's absolutely unnecessary for us to be having a medical education that's inhumane. I mean, it's it's like an oxymoron. It's like you're being trained to deliver health care, but you're being abused at the same time. It makes no sense. And so, like, you know, big wake-up call here. Like, we need to change that. And, and we change it by standing up for what we believe in, for calling things the honest truth. You know, for me just telling you the truth, like, you don't deserve to be abused either during medical school, after medical school, by an employer, by a patient. You don't. Like, you're a human being with feelings who came into this for the great love of humanity to try to help people, and why should you be uh, victimized in the process? It, process? it makes no sense. But anyway, that was my experience 20 years ago. I somehow thought, like, it had changed in 20 years, but apparently not because I keep getting emails from people who are still suffering in medical school even today. And I have no idea. I think your medical school is one of the more humane medical schools, so thank God for that. <laughs> but, you know, you have colleagues out there who are not being treated well, who are in situations where somehow their teachers think fear-based training is still acceptable in 2015. You know, fear-based teaching is really not acceptable anymore. Bullying is like gone out of style. Like bullying, you're not allowed to do that in elementary school and other schools, right? Like hazing, like not allowed in fraternities, not allowed in the military, you know. Why would medical school be the last one to catch on to this, okay? Um, sleep deprivation, that's like more dangerous than um, probably being drunk at work. I mean, really, sleep deprivation is um, somehow part of medical training, which should not be, okay? So I think just to stand up and tell the truth that medical students and physicians should not be sleep deprived, should not be hazed or bullied, and that should be our expectation from here on out. And if you see that, I would ask that you stand up for yourself and for your colleagues who are being mistreated because, uh, first of all, the person who's doing this might not have caught on to its 2015 and that's not in style anymore. And second of all, like it gives a really bad message to, uh, to others that you're willing to be complicit in watching this and not intervene. Like it shows that you're not a real healer if you're going to uh, witness something that's inhumane and not stand up for the person next to you who's probably your classmate or could be a patient, you know, who knows. But uh, there is no place for this in clinics or hospitals in 2015. So I hope you'll stand with me on that one. And I even have anti-bullying cards I can hand out at the end, which I got, which I think are really for like elementary school students, but <laughs> might be relevant for medical students now. So, um, okay, so that was my first year, really sucked. Uh, my second year was a little better, mostly because I was further away from first year. I think that was probably why I felt better is because I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, 
which uh, luckily was not my death. I, uh, during medical school, was really depressed, was not suicidal, although I was sometimes having trouble understanding why it made sense to go on, but I wasn't actively suicidal. Although both the men that I dated in medical school who were classmates died by suicide after I graduated. So it's like this does take a toll on other people if you don't stop this abuse. Um, and I think, you know, that probably led in part to losing many of my colleagues, including both men I dated in medical school. Um, we just need a humane environment in which to practice medicine, and we really need to be healers. Um, and even though you don't have your degrees yet, I would like to encourage you all to be healers today, like right now, like just take on the role of true healer. And um, so anyway, second year was better. Um, third year was, was a lot better because if you haven't figured it out, I really like people, I like talking, I like um, socializing, I like figuring out problems, I like being like in the, in with you humanity. I don't like sitting alone like in a study dungeon or whatever. And so it really helped to finally be able to be with real people in the hospital and um, to deliver babies and to do all the really amazing work that we can do for people and be there during their miles stones in life. And so I, I pretty much, I would say I loved third year and um, fourth year was great because I was able to do a lot of electives and leave town and I went to live on a, uh, in Maui, like on a, I don't know, I somehow got credit, I don't know how I did this, I got credit <laughs> for living like on a commune, like a, in Maui, uh, it was really fun, <laughs> at, like all sorts of parties and I don't know. So um, I also, I don't know, I took an elective, the history of childbirth that made me really happy that I haven't delivered a child in this lifetime or in a previous lifetime. And um, so it was just fun because you have a little more control over your electives and also you definitely see the, you know, the, the diploma coming up pretty soon. So that was great. And then residency was awesome for me because I chose really well. And I would like to encourage you all to choose your residency well. What I did is I knew I wanted to do family medicine and I knew that I wasn't interested like there are a lot of family medicine programs that are like full spectrum and do c-sections and sigmoidoscopies in the grocery store parking lot and we'll teach you to do everything in any setting in the middle of Alaska and it was like well I wasn't really interested in doing that like I'm more into behavioral health and um, and and so I went to a residency that did not really sell itself on a lot of procedures even though I do skin surgeries and minor procedures in my office I really did not see myself doing c-sections on the weekends and doing like sigmoidoscopies and other things like that for fun for a living so I I would much rather talk to people right and so I went to this residency which is University of Arizona Department of Family and Community Medicine and I loved it I thought it was really like much more fabulous than medical school but of course you know reflecting on medical school everything is fabulous after medical school so residency was good and um, and then my first job, okay? Well, that's when things sort of started to suck again. But let me go back to residency. One more thing I want to say about that. So my residency, the title of the program was like family and community medicine. And so in my mind, like I'm like a big picture systems thinker and I wanted to be able to like enact change at like large scale. Like, I don't know, they tried to convince me to go into pediatrics and it's like, well, I could spend all day with this child and not make much progress because the parents are smoking in the house and they live next to a toxic waste dump. You know, in order to deal with the problem that this child is having, I really need to look at the big picture, which involves the incinerator next to their house and their parents smoking and all these other things. And so I chose family and community medicine because I wanted to have um, an effect, a positive effect, not just on individuals, but the entire community. And it was really strange because I don't feel like I learned anything about how to have an impact on a community. I think by nature, I'm a community organizer, so I just like to do this for fun, help community and bring people together and stuff like that. But I thought it was strange that like, I didn't get taught any of this. And so I kind of, on my own, developed my, I guess, community-driven medical practice. So now, into my first job. 
okay? It was um, better than residency in that like they start you off slow on the treadmill. So, and you're making more money, right? So like you're getting paychecks and you're moving maybe slightly slower <clears throat> than residency, but it doesn't take long for them to speed up on the treadmill. And once they get you sped up and you're seeing like double booked, triple booked, you know, like 30 patients a day, I was just like, I can't imagine doing this the rest of my life, assembly line medicine. And, um, and I tried like six jobs in 10 years. Like I got out of that after, like I'm not one to stay anywhere that I don't like, you know? So I, um, my resume looks like just crazy for the first 10 years of my career, I'm like everywhere. But that's because I thought all my jobs pretty much sucked. Um, or they were not what I was looking for and that I could see myself continuing for more than a year or something. And so I tried like a migrant farm worker clinic, I tried a, like hospital owned clinics, small private practices owned by physicians, I even tried like a part time job. I was like, I was really ready to kill myself at that point, not literally, but um, I just couldn't believe that even working just Wednesdays and Thursdays at a part time job, I was still like not happy as a doctor. You know what I mean? That just makes no sense, like I'm hardly working and I still hate my life. Why is that? Because there's no amount of weekend or vacation that can make up for a crappy job. If you have a crappy job, like nothing, well, the only cure for it is to like get an ideal job. Like there is no way to just string yourself along till retirement in a crappy job. But you might like look out and meet other doctors who are stringing themselves along in crappy jobs because they feel trapped and victimized. They don't know how to get out. They think they, you know, or they don't, they, they think they somehow will default on their student loans or not be able to send their kids to college if they don't, you know, they kind of bought the party line, which is kind of BS. Um, and by the way, these employers and health systems, they go to weekend seminars where they learn the talking points that scare the crap out of doctors to keep doctors stuck in their jobs, which are essentially, you're in paper chains. Your employer knows you are their only competition. Why would they put you in an empowering position? They don't want you to have any time to think of, you know, like back up and think about what's going on. They keep you in survival mode. So that, like you're literally like slaves. I mean, I'm sorry to say, like you're high paid, like you're in servitude, you're in paper chains. Like the only one that can get out, I don't know if you saw that, there's something about a goat tied to a tree uh, with a rope somebody showed me and that was so used to being tied to the tree that when they undid the rope, it just stayed there. Like this is physicians, okay? Physicians are standing next to the tree and they're not moving because they think they can't, but you're in paper chains and it's like you're your, empl your employer's only competition is you. You could like slip out and go across the street and make more money working for yourself than staying at a job that you hate. Plus, you'll have a better life. Your wife and husband will like you better. You'll see your kids more. Like all the other good things in life happen when you like your job. And believe me, there's no amount of trips you can take to Hawaii that will erase a crappy job. Okay, so there's just no way to recover from it. Even after the weekends, when you go back on Monday, it still sucks. And you probably didn't enjoy your weekend as much because you are still stuck in a crappy job. So anyway, uh, I had to get out of there and here's what I did. I, um, I basically, I, I just hit rock bottom. I guess I'm one of those people that needs to suffer a lot before I make a decision to do something, you know? Like I need to marinate and like, um, self-pity and stuff like for a really long time. I don't really recommend that. Like I'm trying to give you like the easy way because I did like 10 years of unnecessary misery. Like I took the hit for you guys so don't do it is all I'm saying. You know like I <laughs> so I'm recommending that like just from the get-go when you graduate and you can you know start practicing that you do it the right way that you love and you don't like really follow me through the 10-year detour into like what's all, what you know how many crappy jobs can you accumulate in a short period of time so here's what I did as I realized it suddenly dawned on me wow no matter how many different jobs I try they're all playing the same song it's all assembly line medicine like different faces different clinic managers same situation I even went to Washington and I tried different ones in Oregon and so you know multiple states all the same story and so I just I did get really depressed at that point and um, and I did get 
like just what's the point? Like I'm, I was born to be a healer, and why? I, I can't, I can't believe. I mean, both my parents are physicians. I went to work with them when I was little. I saw like medicine in its heyday. I know like this is BS. I know there's another way. I cannot believe I'm like locked into this. And there's, and there, I, I just had to figure something out, or either go back to waitressing or do something or kill myself. Like there was just no way I could do medicine like this. So I um, had this epiphany that if like the patients aren't happy, because believe me, they're not. Like if you're not happy, the patient's not happy, okay? Um, and so I thought, oh, what if I just ask the patients what they want and then I'll do what they want? They must know what they want, right? And like that's what I did. I basically held like town hall meetings. Um, I guess I call it that because I feel like it was politically subversive or politically active to like bypass all the bureaucracy and hierarchy of medicine and go directly to the end user and with all, you know, with total sincerity ask what do you want because as long as it's basically legal I'll do it, you know, which is what I told them. And I got a hundred pages of written testimony at over six different meetings. The smallest one was like four people in a living room and the largest one was like 30 people in a community center. And so from that, I was able to read and reread all their testimony, and I finally understood what patients want. And guess what? They want exactly what I want. So we were all on the same page, and I don't know what all these other people are doing in the room. Too many cooks in the kitchen. They need to get a real job because, quite frankly, I just listened to what the people wanted in my town. And what they wanted was a small office and one doctor or a nurse practitioner, whomever, but since I was the doctor presenting this, they were writing in terms of doctor. And they want to be able to have accessible visits and house calls if necessary, and you know, they're totally happy to pay you. They want an integrative approach. They want, you know, if you can't help them, let them know which acupuncturist to see. I mean, they want like all those really, they want it to be fun. They want it to be, you know, um, down the street. They don't want it to be a hassle. I mean, it, they basically want every single thing that you guys want, so like, it, there's a word called disintermediation. Does anyone know what that term means? Disintermediation. You should write that down. It's really important. Disintermediation. D-I-S-I-N-T-E-R-M-E-D-I-A-T-I-O-N. Disintermediation means removing the middlemen. A really great way of, of life. When you remove the middlemen, yes, there is a term for that, then suddenly, check it out, you have a direct, you're more likely to have that direct relationship with the patient. The patient is paying you, and get all those middlemen that are taking huge cuts out of the patient's payment, whether from insurance or self pay, like they're not in the room anymore. See, so honestly, I went from, um, I, in my favorite factory job, my overhead was 74%. I brought in $500,000 a year, which meant in a, two years, I brought in a million dollar revenue to that office, and my overhead was $370,000 a year. It's like, I mean, I could think of a better way to spend $370,000 than on overhead at a clinic they don't even own. You know what I mean? And so, it's like, the difference between doing that and practicing the way I am now, like just, these are numbers from like 2000 and 2004. And so in 2000, uh, at my favorite factory job, my overhead was 74%, which meant if somebody came in and gave me 100 bucks for an office visit, that like $74 like went out the window. And I was maybe getting like $26 before taxes, okay? So that's how much I was getting for treating like pneumonia, let's just say, okay? Now, at my current practice, um, I can, since I have like 10% overhead, basically, I have no staff and I do everything myself and it's really fun, really easy, and you know you can streamline stuff on the, on the through you know your laptop and everything. You don't need to have a ton of employees. P patients can schedule themselves on appointment quests. There's all different ways you can do this in a streamlined fashion because you see businesses start all the time, streamlined businesses using technology. And um, so anyway, now if I see a patient, same patient, 100 bucks, like I keep 90 and ten dollars goes to overhead. Like that, you can pay off your student loans a lot quicker if you keep ninety versus twenty-six. Just FYI on that, okay? And the other thing is I wanted to figure out, because all these doctors look so tired, I was like, there's gotta be a formula that proves why these guys are just a, a wreck and why they're so tired. And so, um, 
And by the way, I'll email you later, hopefully I remember this, to email you the document that has all my calculations so you can look at like the numbers before and after. But there's another calculation I did called days needed to work. So the percent overhead, by the way, you should figure that out for every job. Because you need to know like how much money you're giving away just for the you know privilege of working there, right? Okay, then days needed to work. I wanted to know like how many days I needed to go into the office every year just to pay my yearly overhead. Well, this will blow your mind. So at my favorite factory job, I worked 190 days a year on my contract, and 74% of that is 143 days. So I went to work 143 days every year for free. How do you like that? Like, if you want to be abused, definitely sign up for a job where you're working 143 days for free. And, and they're, they're not easy days. They're like alarm goes off way before your natural circadian rhythm wants to get up. You are going to work and staying like way later than dinner. And you're seeing like 30 patients a day. And you're doing it for free. And your student loans are not coming down at all because you don't even get to keep any of that. So 8.6 months out of the year, I was working for free, which is why I hated this. And that, that was my favorite job. I had worse jobs than that. Okay, now I could pay my yearly overhead in, um, it was like, let me figure this out, 11 half days. I work three half days a week uh, for the most part for the last 10 years. I work afternoons and evenings, so I never, I have never set an alarm for work in 10 years. Doesn't that sound great? Mm -hmm. I make the same amount of money working on my own as I worked part-time, as I did working full-time because I was giving all this away. I was giving all my labor away and all my energy and my love and everything that I give my patients. It was just like for free, like, yeah, sure, rip me off every day, okay? And so now, the other number, which, is think, which I think really hits home, is numbers needed to treat. I'm sure you've heard that term um, used in other contexts. But I use numbers needed to treat in terms of, um, like, economics. You know, how many numbers of patients do I need to treat per year to pay my yearly overhead? And in my previous practice, favorite factory job, that same example, does anyone want to guess how many patients I had to see to pay my yearly overhead? A lot. Just guess. Um, I haven't seen well, at eight and a half months. Uh huh. Right. Well, just throw a number out. Four thousand. Oh my God, he's so good. 4,004. <laughs> he's going places. Okay. 4,004 patients that I saw every year for free. Can you imagine seeing 4,004 patients for free just for fun while your student loans, like interest is not even, like, you know, while you can't pay your mortgage and you have to send your kid to day school, you don't have any preschool leftover money for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Come on. Like, wake up. You do not have to do this. You do not have to be abused. I mean, oh my God. Gosh, physicians are being abused all across this country and they won't even call it abuse. They just think it's normal now. Frogs in the hot water, they think it's normal to be boiling over. Like really, the next generation, you guys have to put a stop to this because this is insanity, okay? And so in my current practice, I can pay my yearly overhead in 88 patients. It feels so much better. Talk about freedom. Talk about feeling good every day. Talk about having time to come to your medical school and speak for free is because I'm not like on a friggin' clock working 8.6 months. Why are other doctors not able to come here and spend all night and smile and give out free books and so they don't even have time to write a book. They don't even know what their name is by the end of the day. They can't even finish their charts over the weekend to start the next week fresh. They're completely a disaster zone, you know, and, they, and they're living like that like it's normal. Please tell them it's not. And don't do this to yourself, you know, because it's unnecessary. So that is um, my little quick story on the three calculations that you need to know. And then um, let me just point out a few other things that I think you should be aware of. And then please ask me questions, like raise your hand anytime if you have a question. But I basically think there's three big mismatched, expe you know, mismatched expectations, I think, is really what gets people into trouble, like even with dating or like, I don't know, raising children or any of that stuff. Like if you in your mind have one idea of how something is supposed to go and it doesn't go that way, like then it creates tension in your relationship and 
I think you all know what I'm talking about. But a lot of times we're not really clear on what we want, so it's not really the other person's fault because they can't read our minds, right? But I think there's three huge mismatched, mismatched expectation areas in medical training that need to just be stated out loud for the books, right? One is there's a medical student expectation that is not met by medical schools. And I, I believe this has to, this probably has to, you know, do with your personal statement where you're writing, you know, what your end goal is, what your dreams are, why you even want to come to medical school, and you get invited to, to, to pay $50,000 a year or more, which you would think that's to put you on the path of your personal statement coming true or coming to fruition, right? But like, does anyone ever ask you, you know, that's like your dream that brought you to medical school. Does anyone ever ask you again, like, are, how are you doing with your dream? Or are we meeting your expectations? Or, you know, do, no, they never say that. In fact, they probably say the worst, like, your dream is dumb. That can't happen. Like, that's not possible anymore. You have to do assembly line medicine. They don't really give you the tools to live out your personal statement, which to me is like a total breach of contract. Like, you just paid $200,000 or more for tuition. They, you got accepted based based on your personal statement, and nobody taught you how to make that come true, and that was the whole reason you're here? That's really strange. Okay, that's, that, like, that doesn't work. That's a mismatched expectation. I mean, I think it's like normal that medical students would, coming in, expect that their training would teach them to, if they accept you, right? They're basically saying, yeah, we can teach you how to be what you described on your personal statement. But like, that gets filed in a drawer and never looked at again. And then you graduate and you even forget like your name and what that was, and it's so long ago, and like, it's a blur. I don't know, I think that's wrong. So I think medical schools need to teach to your personal statement. I need to at least ask you sometime during the four years, how are we doing getting you to your, let's get out your personal statement here. We have it right in this drawer. Let's see how we're doing or how, how are you doing? You know, it's not all their fault. You know, like you have to do some work too, right? So how are, you know, call to action. This is your call to action. Are you making your personal statement come true? Like dig it out. If I were you, I would post it on your wall, put it in your bathroom mirror, put it everywhere like this is what your north star is this what's this is what's guiding you through your training if you don't have your personal statement which is your like big full you know your your soul's desire to even be here like there's no reason to be here you wouldn't just do this just because it's fun because it's not like just fun to like <laughs> sit and study for you know what I mean like you wouldn't just volunteer to do this I think like you're all doing this so that in the end you can be that person that you had described in your personal statement so it's partly up to you to um, live that out and I would also ask your schools to please teach to your personal statement and help you find the mentors that you need so that your personal statement is going to come to fruition. And then the second thing is a humane learning env environment. Like, I just think, like, when I came into medical school, healthcare, you know, like, I just assumed, like, I had a really great college, Wellesley College, all women, like, they told us from day one, you're women, don't take any shit from anyone, like, you can be anything you want in the world, I mean, come on, Hillary Clinton went there, and Madeleine Albright, and, you know, Diane Sawyer, I mean, I come from a place where like women can do anything and don't let anyone stop you. Okay, then I go to medical school and they're like, shut up, sit down, follow the rules, we don't want to hear back from you, you know, for four years, don't cause any trouble. You know, and like me, like I thought education was about asking questions and learning and um, and and it's okay to have a different opinion and you're allowed to dissent you know like I didn't think education was groupthink and like right left right left shut up and don't ask anything and that's basically what medical school felt like to me like an indoctrination process where like you weren't allowed to have a different opinion and that was distressing and that's inhumane and that's not an education that's like indoctrination that's something else that's groupthink I don't know there's another term for it but it's not higher education and so a humane learning environment is like a mismatch I think you all came in probably expecting a humane learning environment I don't, I don't know what your medical school is like I think it's better than most but there are schools that still use like I said fear-based teaching that don't encourage open dialogue that are intolerant to dissent that have like a memorization regurgitation cycle of learning you know and so this is um, not working 
And so just for the record on YouTube, and whoever watches this, this isn't working. And uh, I would encourage you guys to stand up and say that you actually, you know, out there in the world, you require an actual humane education that you're paying for, big bucks. It needs to be humane. The third, well the second, so that was one category where I think medical students have mismatched expectations and that creates tension, having to do again with the personal statement, having to do with an expectation for a learning environment that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, also I think, I'll just throw in there, you kind of expect that you're going to have mentors that you can look up to. And I hear from medical students all the time, they haven't found any mentors. They, it's like medical school is an anti-mentorship program. You meet a lot of doctors you'd never want to become. You know? And so that is not what you're paying for. Like, you've got to remind these people. You're paying for an education. You're paying to get really good mentorship. You're paying for your personal statement to come true. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. What are you paying for? So that mismatched expectation is the first one. The second one is there's, there's um, mismatched expectations between patients and their doctors, especially in primary care. Patients come in. I mean, if you're getting a lung transplant, you're getting a lung transplant. I think, okay, you come out on the other side, you have your lung transplant, hopefully you live. Like, that's easy, right? If you can do that kind of a procedure and you're going into tertiary care. Primary care, well, that's like you're dealing more with emotions, the person's culture, the community, the neighborhood. Neighborhood, are they smoking? All sorts of behaviors. Like medical school doesn't really teach us, did not teach me, to deal with being a real primary care doctor, helping people know what to eat. Help, I mean, I had to learn this all on my own outside of medical. Like I paid my tuition. My tuition, I learned nothing about how to really help my patients except for I did learn if they had strep throat, give them penicillin. I did learn like what drug to give for what cookbook diagnosis, like cookbook style medicine. I learned that, but not like you know what most people really need, I did not get trained in, which is upsetting because I paid the money and didn't get the training, okay? And so I had to learn on my own, like on the weekends and from my patients. Like a patient will tell me this homeopathic worked for her insomnia. Oh great, let me write that down so I can tell other patients that maybe they could try this homeopathic too. I didn't learn this in medical school. Oh wow, it worked for you too? I'll write it down again. I'm learning medicine from my patients. Patients have an expectation that you know more than them, that you can guide them. You know, I think they want more than just to know what drug to take for strep throat. And they want more than just interventions and pills. We do not, I didn't get trained in that. So that's a mismatch there. So they basically want a holistic approach. This is 2015 now, 20 years later. Maybe they wanted something different like in 1950. Maybe they just wanted a guy to pat them on the shoulder and the guy in the white coat to say, take two aspirin, call me in the morning. You know, that might have worked like before, like when people were more into like the authoritarian patriarchal model. But people don't really want that now. They want a partnership and they really want answers. And they're going to Google the answers on the internet if you don't have them. And then you're going to look like an idiot. You know, like we should really have some of these answers, okay? And so then they want time. That's the other thing that's like, I think they go in hoping and praying that they're going to get their time that they need with you to get their answers to their questions. They do not want a seven minute office visit and they keep getting shoved into these inadequate office, but like some places like at Kaiser or wherever, like my friends have to do like 20 minute physicals. How, like think of all the holes in the body. Can you really look in all the holes in the body in 20 minutes without just being like a complete ass? Probably not. Like it takes time and you have to be gentle and you can't just like, I mean, this makes no sense. Can you really humanely do a, a physical in 20 minutes on somebody and still have them like you at the end? <laughs> like probably not. So like there's a mismatch between patients, what they want from you and what you are giving to them. So the third one is I think there's this really interesting primary care mismatch where primary care, as you know, medical training is really, maybe here it's different, Lebanon, rural, okay, but in general for my training, it was like a tertiary care environment. You know, and tertiary care was like what we were all supposed to do. And if there was lip service about primary care, it was just lip service because they basically thought you were an idiot to go into failing medicine because if you had a brain, you would be a surgeon or you'd do something really worthwhile. You know, that, that was kind of the message that I think a lot of people still get at medical school is like, who would go into primary care? You just couldn't get into radiology or whatever. You couldn't get into a real specialty or something. And so I think like the overall environment is very toxic for primary care. People who want to go into primary care, like we don't, 
don't get the mentors, we don't get the, uh, like we're belittled for choosing this often. And so um, the other thing is, which I think is re really, really important, is that whenever politicians talk about health care, they literally really should just be talking about tertiary care because nothing they say makes much sense for primary care. If you need a lung transplant, for example, you do need like a five-story hospital and a helipad and a team and lungs on ice and everyone running down the hall and it's a whole ordeal, right? And you need like high overhead. You're probably paying high overhead to get a good lung transplant. You do not need that for an ingrown toenail. You don't need that for a pap smear. You know what I mean? But when politicians talk about like funding health care, like they're lumping it all together. Like you do not need a team for a pap smear. In fact, that would be like offensive. Do you want like a football team to come in and do your pap smear? It doesn't make any sense. And so like to basically talk about primary and tertiary care and po political conversations and the news and funding mechanisms, it's two different animals. It's like, just look at um, your car insurance. Like really, every time you wanna fill up your car, you're gonna get approval from State Farm. Like if you're gonna get a rock chip fixed in your window, do you really wanna call your insurance company? It makes no sense to involve all these people in the simple day-to-day -day events of life. If your car explodes, on the highway or if you you know what I mean it's totaled then you call the insurance company you know that's what we should be that's what insurance is for like catastrophes and so by using insurance and making primary care fit into a tertiary care model which does not work which leads to seven minute office visits which leads to not a very good medical education that's geared towards primary care which leads to um, just 40% more cost of the average primary care visit because we're involving all these people that don't that should should not be in the room. That's what causes the problem. So those are the three mismatches. And then my final little comment is that I recently discovered, you know, I've been thinking about this stuff for 10 years or longer. So I've come up with all these ideas which I think need to be distributed and discussed um, in a real open dialogue with people in healthcare and especially medical students. Like the sooner you understand this, the sooner you can prevent yourself from from falling into potholes like along the way in your career. And so the, the final thing I want to say is medical school really should teach three different skill sets, medical training, including residency. And those three skill sets are the technical skills, the business skills, and the human skills that you need to be a doctor, okay? And I think I'm going to just give Western um, medical schools the benefit of the doubt that they do a really good job teaching the Western technical skills that you need to be a doctor. What drug to give for strep throat, how to do a lung transplant, that kind of thing. You can do the technical skills. They do not teach the other part of the technical skills, like the holistic area, the area of like generally um, eating, exercise, um, acupuncture, you know, like at least when I went, I don't know now, but I'm just saying some schools really don't teach you about, you know, re reflexology, homeopathics, you know, stuff that used to be taught before Western medical schools took over and put the other medical schools out of business. Um, so, so basically you learn, I don't know, I'll just say half of one skill set, half of the technical skills that you need, especially in primary care, because people want to know these other answers to their questions that they're not getting. And then and the business skills, we learn zero. Zero business skills. I had to learn all this on my own. And you know, these 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 formulas that I shared with you changed my whole life. And just the whole business of medicine, which is very easy, but if you don't control the business of medicine, who's controlling it? The people who are controlling you. And they love to stay in power because they're making a lot of they're going on trips on the weekends that they love. They're playing golf all day. They're doing stuff that they love while you're working on a treadmill for them. And they don't have student loans, and they're, you know, and they're telling you you're not moving fast enough. So they're really like in your way, especially in primary care. And then the third skill set are the human skills that you need to be a doctor. Like, how do you give bad news? How do you tell parents their three-year-old died in a car accident? How do you like grieve the loss of a patient? Like that isn't, at least I did not get taught any of that. Like we just were winging it. And so basically without learning those three skill sets that you need to be the doctor that you described on your personal statement, you basically are graduating like an automaton robot because you didn't learn the human skills and you did not learn the business skills. So you were basically easy prey for anyone who wants a workaholic humanitarian to work their butt off for them and for them to run to the bank with all the money. And that's 
what I have to say. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I really hope you guys will stand up for yourself and not be preyed upon. And I want to answer questions. So if anyone has, if you want to, I, I gave out little sheets of paper. If you, I don't know, you can just blurt out your questions. You must have questions. But um, thanks for coming. Sure. So, any? So, um, I have one real quick. Uh huh. Could you tell us a little bit about your comprises your patient panel? My patient panel. Okay, so my patient panel. I have. I work part time Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, afternoons and evenings, um, generally for the last ten years. And my patient panel. I mean, I have like I don't know about eight hundred inactive patients, and maybe like you know because they moved out of town. I'm in a college town. Students come and go. People die. People move on. Um, I think I have about like 500 active patients and so this is over 10 years like basically average about 500 patients which I think is like a manageable number that I can handle right doing a good job for them answering their questions in 30 to 60 minute visits and feeling like I could sleep well at the end of the day knowing that I actually delivered health care and not like I don't know like doc in the box or RB sandwiches or whatever I mean I don't want to feel like I'm doing like a weird fast food job medicine like it. so anyway yeah so that's um does that answer? So the pa the patient panel. So it's eighty per like generally eighty to ninety percent now insured. Maybe twenty percent, ten to twenty percent uninsured. Just with Obamacare, that kind of switched a little bit. But like I love seeing patients. Like um, I'm now out of network with insurance companies, which I love. I was a preferred provider for ten years, which meant that I like signed all these insurance contracts and was willing to accept whatever they wanted to pay me. Which in Oregon, it's like the second highest reimbursing state in the country. So it's great like to work in Oregon. Insurance companies like no problem you can get paid really well by contracting with insurance companies but I just got tired of following all their rules and actually um, like I just want to be I like the personally now I like the idea of being free to charge what I want and getting paid a fair amount for what I'm doing so like if I'm delivering $150 of service and the insurance company says it's only worth 109 you know what I mean like it just feels like considering like I put all this love and attention into people and by the way going back to the 4004 number of patients that I saw for free I answered about five questions per patient because I'm just one of those overextender I'll answer like their marriage problems the UTI like the, what's wrong with their dog I mean I'll try to cover everything and so five questions per 4004 people that was like over 20,000 questions that I answered for free and so I just want to say like it's so much nicer when you have a panel, a patient panel that you can handle, which are people that selected you because they love you. They didn't select Kaiser. They didn't select like whatever the organization is or, you know, like they, they really like handpicked me. It's kind of like going on a date with somebody who really wants to date you instead of like just somebody in Eugene. You know what I mean? It feels totally different. And so like... <laughs> So, so yeah, it's like a great group of people. I love taking care of the people who have selected me, and they, um, it's just, it's like a party now. I, I just love going to work. So, more questions about anything I said? Do you still do hospital visits if you have a patient that's in the hospital? Do I still do hospital visits? So, I did like for the first two years and then I gave up my hospital privileges because basically I only had like one or two patients uh, a year needing to be hospitalized and they mostly needed like specialists they weren't even primary care issues so I did like I did like more like social visits and so but the weird thing is the reason why I gave up hospital privileges which I really enjoyed seeing my hospitalized patients when they were mine versus like I'm covering for 20 people and I'm walking into the room of a dying guy who I've never met before and I have to tell his wife sorry your husband died and I have no idea who you guys are you know which is totally different than really knowing people but the hospital that I was associated with raised their hospital staff dues to $700 a year. And it used to be, yeah, you pay like an entry fee to get into the hospital, which is like a weird assault because like who knew that you had to pay like just to get in to see your patients? You know what I mean? My, my ex-husband, um, at the time my husband, when I told him this, he was like, you have to pay an entrance fee to get into the hospital? You know, and it's like, 
Yeah, and the thing is, those two patients, even if they were primary care and I was billing, I would never even make up the $700. Like it was a loss, like the hospital made money off of me. And the thing is that the hospital dues were only $300 a year for multiple years, up until one year when it became $700 they opened a new hospital in town. And um, that was really big and I guess they needed money. But um, I called them to find out like, well, why would my hospital dues go from 300 to seven? That's a big leap, don't you think? And they're like, well, they only raised those dues on courtesy physicians, not active physicians. So active physicians admit more than 25 patients a year and courtesy admit less than 25 per year. So I was getting penalized by, from being a low utilizer by a hospital that really could give a crap about me because if like they did care, like they wouldn't discriminate and charge you twice as much of an entry fee when you're hardly going in. You know what I mean? So, um, so that was really crazy. And so then they were, rewarding, they were rewarding the docs that actually brought them business. Really, what that was. Yeah, that. And then I did. I, I did organize several physicians to go meet with like the hospital staff um, director, like medical director of staff, just to um, like these other ninety. So there's 300 doctors in town that were like um, active staff, and about 94 who were courtesy staff. And because they're so busy on assembly line, they don't have any, and they're not even paying the $700. The clinic manager is sending it in. They don't really know that they're getting penalized because they're not like looking through all their bills like I am, now that I have all my free time to really figure out my bills and stuff. And so I let some of them know, like, do you realize you're getting penalized? Um, and they, and I got like 10 or so of them together to come to the hospital. Well, I made an appointment with a medical staff guy who, I guess he just thought I was coming in and he could handle just Pamela Weibel by herself. But I brought 10 guys with me who had a lot to say about why they didn't want to get charged $700. And I think he like wiggled around in his seat and lowered it to 500 but still, just the um, just the principle of it. And another doctor, which I think is really interesting, I emailed her just to let her know she's a dermatologist in town, and um, I let her know about this. And she wrote back, um, "Just call one eight hundred. You are fucked." And I thought it was a joke, but like it wasn't a joke. If you dial one eight hundred, you are f u c k e d. It leads to the billing department at the hospital where I work. So isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Like you don't even have to read between the lines. Sometimes you're just totally getting screwed at your job, and all you have to do is dial the phone number. It's been their phone number for 30 years. I was told. So anyway, you know what I mean? The Catholic nuns would not approve of this. <laughs> I just couldn't go on with it. I had to like give up my privileges. Just because, you know, I felt that. Just I'd like to align myself with people who are kind of in the same ethics and stuff. So okay. Any more so that did that answer your question? Probably got more than what you bargained for. Okay. More questions. Did you have a question? Somebody over here. Question. Yeah. Why don't you just speak a little more about um, the kind of patients you have, like yellow or older, like white collar or blue collar, you know? Okay, the kind of patients I have? Well, I got these really interesting group of patients who came to see me that hadn't seen a doctor in like 20 or 30 years. So I think I got like kind of a third world medicine experience because these are people who distrusted Western medicine. But because I did a town hall meeting and I seemed like different than the standard assembly line doctor, they were willing to trust me. So I got to diagnose all sorts of weird things, including like the first second chapter in that book is the first patient who walked in was like a guy with renal artery stenosis and we had to do like emergency you know like it's been really fun because I've had like a group of people who've had out of control medical problems that I got to diagnose um, so it wasn't like the boring just strep throat UTI strep throat UTI stuff you know and so I have like um, you know like middle class I don't think I have like a ton of like super wealthy people like I kind of gravitate towards like the rest regular person, you know? So it's a regular person clinic uh, filled with a lot of people who are um, really interesting and off the grid types and um, just pe a lot of women, you know, like 70% of all office visits are women, as far as I understand, unless you're a urologist, maybe it's a little different in that clinic. But um, so as a female primary care doctor, you're going to get at least 70% of your clients are going to be women. Maybe if you're a male doctor, you get more males, but um, so mostly women. I don't do like a ton of kids, like I just really never gravitated towards people that you can't really talk to because you just don't like just changing diapers and like not making that many sounds. It just doesn't appeal to me. I like people who can talk to you and you can do stuff with and stuff like that. So, 
so yeah, older people who are not in diapers, and um, and uh, people who are in diapers is fine too. They're still, they can still talk to me. I just like to. I don't want to do veterinary medicine. I'm just not kind of into that. So, okay. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so you said you're, you're no longer contracted with insurances. So are your patients um, all paying up front? Or so since I'm not contracted with insurance companies, um, are my patients all paying up front? No, I'm still billing insurance companies who will, they, what happens if you're, see this is like the business side of medicine that you, did, you should be learning in residency and medical school because this impacts like what you might want to do later. So there's um, self-pay, I think everyone gets that. The, 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 I'm sure you've read about people that just break free of everything and just are doing cash only. So that's one way of doing it. And that's the way that used to be d done before 1965. That was the predominant way that it's always been done until we had third party insurances. Then there are two different ways you can deal with insurance companies. You can like totally play their game and sign their contract and be a preferred provider because you're like in their little special clique of people willing to take less money per patient, usually, um, and follow all their little rules, which some of them you might think are dumb. You know, like to contract with an insurance company, you generally have to fill out like, I mean, they want to know like you have your medical degree and you don't have a DUIs and you know, you fill out the same paperwork that you fill out for everything. Um, and then what happens is most of them are super straightforward and easy to deal with in Oregon. So they'll want to send you like a five page contract where it basically says, we're the insurance company, you're the doctor, you see the patient, we'll send you the money and they give you like some amount that they're willing to send you um, per patient like um, RVU or whatever, there's a certain formula, and you, know, you can see what it is, and then you can see, do you think it's fair or not? Basically, they pay like hospitals more, and they pay big clinics more, because they have people that are negotiators there that'll be like, well, if you don't you know, do it our way, we're taking all our 50,000 patients out of your system, and they're like, oh, well, we'll give you whatever you want. You know what I mean? They have more negotiating power just because they're covering more people. So anyway, but the reimbursement is really high here, so I, I just didn't have a problem taking that to begin with. But what's so interesting, so most most insurance companies are totally by the book, easy to deal with. But every once in a while, like um, HealthNet, for example, I wanted to contract with them because I was going to basically take all insurance and then one by one as they pissed me off, I would like stop taking the ones I didn't like just because I'm one of those people that I like everyone and you have to piss me off before I don't like you. And so I just wanted to like give them the benefit of the doubt that they're all really nice and that I could deal with them, which was not the case. Um, but anyway, so HealthNet, what they did, which was super funny, before they would send me the contract, they wanted to come to my office, which they had to send somebody driving down from Portland two hours to Eugene and measure the space between the toilet and the wall. And they had all these other little things they were doing in my office, which I thought was like, they wouldn't even give me the contract until they made sure I had enough space between the toilet and the wall. And a few other like weird things that I would have, you know, like, is your medicine locked? Yeah, I'm the only one in here. I have no staff. Like, I have no, yeah. You know, like they had to go through a checklist of like all this minutia. And then they sent me a contract, but their contract was like 30 pages. It was like so much longer than the other straightforward contracts. So I found in there, there was like, and I read it all like back, by the way, if you're an employee or even a resident, uh, you're, the, you will get all these contracts put on your desk and they just want you to sign them and you don't even have time to read them and you are signing your life away all the time on these contracts that you don't even know what they're reading but I read them all now that I had time and there was a line in there that said if we decide that somehow it was your fault for something or other you're going to pay all our legal costs and I was like oh no there's no way I'm going to sign a contract that says I'm going to pay for all the legal costs of a health insurance company that could be a lot of legal costs you know what I mean but I bet a lot of doctors out there signed that contract because they didn't have time to read it. So, um, so what it means if you're a preferred provider, you are signing on the dotted line and you are signing things that you may not even agree with. You are signing away your income, which if you have student loans, like you're signing away like 20, 30 percent of your income that you should be earning and they're keeping, you know what I mean? Because they're still getting their premiums every month. You're just not paying off your student loans fast enough. You know, okay, so then 
that's preferred provider. If you, and, and the reason why people do that is I think um, when you're a preferred provider, you can get like a high volume of patients really quick because they see you're in, the, you're, you're in the book and you're a preferred provider and like the patient only has to pay $20 copay and you live in the neighborhood. You might not be like the best person for them, but since you live in the neighborhood and you're close by and at only 20 bucks, they'll come to you. You know what I mean? So it's like a volume thing and it's not very personalized and relationship driven because that person might not want to see you if you cost $40. Then you spend all this time doing all this work and changing diapers on this guy you don't even like and the minute it costs him 25 instead of 20, he's out the door. You know what I mean? Why don't you just get the people that really like you? Then it's more fun to go to work and they'll totally pay you your real fees. And they, you know, because now that I'm out of network, I can charge my real fees. But I still bill the insurance company as a benefit to the patient because it's just too hard for patients to figure out how to do that on their own and I already know how to do it and you can do it online really easily. So I'll just do it online like one or two minutes after each appointment I submit the claim and then I get paid and instead of getting paid like $109 for the visit because they're um, because I was a preferred provider, now that I'm out of network, maybe they only pay me 70. So the out of pocket for the patient instead of 20 is now $39.64 or something different. Like the patient has to pay more, but I get paid at the end of the day my fair rate and I don't have to sign any contracts with insurance companies. So that's what it means to be out of network. So you're paid, you know, and and so that's kind of a good middle road for some people because I'm happy at the end of the day. My patients still can use their insurance somewhat, not as much, but they love me and they're gonna come to me whether I take their insurance or not often. So, so that's how that works. This is an example of school insurance will pay 80% of an out of network provider's cost. So that would be an example. I have another question. Uh-huh. So um, you have a ton of free, uh, free time from what I understand. And I know one of the things that, that you particularly enjoy doing is helping other physicians who have tired of the of treadmill medicine to move out and kind of explore the idea of their own ideal clinic. Could you tell us about a couple, or one example of how that worked out really well and one example that maybe didn't work out so well so we might learn Okay. So yeah, so he said like that, and it's true, I do teach physicians and medical students and residents how to open their ideal clinics. They have retreats and teleseminars and private coaching and whatever. I, and I also like to help people for free. So, and if any of you want to come to the retreat, I have a retreat coming up. Um, maybe Claire wants to say something about that, about what it was like for her. She's in the back. Maybe she'll share because it is really helpful maybe to hear from one of your peers what it was like for them. And then I can tell you some success stories and some unsuccessful Absolutely. stories. So whenever you want to come up, you can. And, um, and so, yeah, so the retreats that I do, the next one is in October. They're twice a year. I do October and May. And so, yeah, Claire came to one of the retreats and she, oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll stand next to her because I have the microphone here. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> My microphone fell. Okay. Okay, yeah, go ahead and tell us. You came to the retreat. So I just want to say um, I'm a third year medical student, and Pam has been an amazing mentor for me during this time. Um, I just want to say that I almost left medicine. I took a, a leave of absence for about a year and a half, uh, and that was after my first semester of school. Um, I, I saw what was happening out there in the field and I didn't want to be a part of it and I didn't know another way. Um, so I kind of, I did a lot of re internal reflection and I met Pam and I, I went to the retreat and uh, it was amazing. It was life changing. I saw all these people that really wanted to make a difference and truly wanted to heal what you, you know, what you put on your personal statement, right? It's it's kind of funny that we forget about it because you get so involved in school and there's just all this stuff you have to memorize, you know, and you almost forget that, but it really is why we're here, you know. We are here to make a really big difference in the world. And I just want to say it's, it was incredible. I, I learned a lot. I learned about myself and I came out and I came out completely inspired and through that experience I came back to school. That was the impetus of me coming back. Um, and I'm so happy I'm on rotations now, and I had the most amazing summer. Oh my gosh, so 
I'm, I'm really interested in OMT, um, more preventative, holistic, integrative care. And some of the stuff that we did was just unbelievable. These people that had chronic conditions and medication lists that were really, really long and saw all these other experts that weren't getting healed, they just kept getting handed medicines. They're causing all these side effects and it's not their fault, you know, it's the docs, how they're taught, the doctors are taught that way. Um, and you can't treat chronic conditions that way, but they'd come to us and we were able to help them and people were crying. Like I was crying during some of the treatments. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it was like, it brings tears right now talking about it. But yeah, and this whole concept has been on my mind, you know, too, while I've been through this. Pam has been a huge influence because um, you need time with your patients. You know, I know there's, there are certain types of care where there's acute medicine and, you know, you have to go in there and you have to save someone with a myocardial infarction, you know, or they have a broken arm and whatnot. But there's, there's a crisis right now, especially with chronic care. And we need time with people. We need time with people. And there's models out there to be able to do this. And you guys are, you know, it's a big step for you guys coming here. So thank you. And you're on an amazing path. So I just want to tell you. Yeah. Yay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, so Claire came as a medical student, and it's great. The sooner you learn this, the better. But um, as far as some success stories, I can, um, I have videos online. You might want to Google um, the happiest doctor in Idaho. That's a really great success story. Ten minute interview with a physician that opened an ideal clinic. And so I think the success stories are a lot like my story. Um, the people that aren't successful, um, one man I know, um, he started his own clinic and got really into the IT stuff. And he was one year out of residency. He went straight into his ideal clinic. And he sort of didn't balance it correctly. He got kind of more into the higher overhead and more into the technology stuff and didn't keep it simple enough. And I think, um, so he went back into working for a group, which the group that he's working for is really not so bad, but he's still dreaming of going back and trying an ideal clinic now that he's, you know, older, more mature, has figured out kind of some of the things that he might do differently next time. And then, um, and then I know one other, like I only really know two stories that weren't like super successful. One other guy was open for um, like almost a year and only had like 30 patients or something, but um, he also had depression and he wasn't, you know, like you have to be well when you start your clinic see that's the you know people are coming to you for health so if you're just basically like still have PTSD from medical school and are still like not like that like you're not gonna attract I don't think you're gonna attract people for health if you're not healthy and so like that's why it's so important during medical school to stay healthy and to get like um, emotional um, to get massages get um, counseling uh, off the books so that you don't have to report it, um, you know, stuff like that because, you know, get whatever you need to do, talk to your friends, you know, you need to keep a journal, try not to graduate a mess because then you're going to start residency, like not very stable. And then when you graduate, you're not going to be in a position to open your own clinic because you're really not going to be well enough to do it. So you have to be well and you have to keep your overhead low. I would say those are the things that are most important. And I do think it's really important to reach out to the community because if you're delivering something that you think is cool and nobody else really understands, then nobody's going to come to you because like you're not really relevant to, or you might be relevant, but they don't understand how you're describing and messaging yourself. You know, people need a lot of reminders about your scope of practice. I have a patient who's a friend of mine. And even though she's read pet goats and pap smears, like she didn't know I did pap smears. So it's like, <laughs> you have to remind people all the time, you know, they're smoking pot, they're too relaxed. They don't, you know, like you have to remind them, like I, I do ingrown toenails. I do pap smears. I, you know, can do your physicals. You don't have to go to Planned Parenthood. You know, like there's a constant uh, education that you need to do because your patients have no idea what the scope of your practice is unless you tell them over and over again. Okay. So any other questions about anything? Sure. Yeah. Questions. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. It's really great to hear from you and hear your perspective. Um, I'm a first year student and I would just ask you if you had any just general recommendations for all of the hoop jumping that we do have to do uh, or just, uh, just take it from there. 
So as a first year medical student, she wants to know so if I... Coming to medical school is actually hoop jumping. Yeah. Wondering how you maintain a quality of life. But I'm, I'm older and I have previous master's degrees and things. And so it's like, what am I giving up to do this? And will it only be worth it in 10 years? How do you make it worth it during the process? So how do you make it worth it during the process if you're, you know, older, wiser student and suddenly coming back to being treated like you're in kindergarten with hoop jumping and stuff? It sounds like, you know, that might be the question. Like, well, how do you keep your yourself uh, happy and joyful and, and make this uh, of some value while you're having to jump through all these hoops. So one is like to have a firm north star ahead of you, which is your personal statement. Like really, I can't drive that home enough. Like that has to be like your motivation for getting up every day, the people that you're going to heal, the doctor that you're going to be, because if you, if that gets blurred out at all, like none of this makes any sense. So that's one thing. The other thing is to like see your education for what it really is. Like, honestly, some of you are like, ahead of your professors in certain ways. Like, you know, you're learning things from, your instructors are not the be all end all. You know, they happen to know some subject matter in greater detail than you. And so you can learn that little bit from them, but you might be more advanced psychologically or emotionally or in other ways. So don't give away your power. Like understand that you are a super powerful person and you're already a healer. And so like, Honor your teachers for what they're able to teach you. And then quite honestly, you might, in teaching is like a bilateral sort of thing. Like you might be able to give feedback to a teacher that really helps them teach better in the future because you're seeing things in them that might not be working anymore in modern day life uh, in 2015. And so to like give like feedback from a place of love and constructive, you know, criticism sort of a thing. And so I think if you like can take yourself out of this, um, um, hierarchy and like see yourself, at least you, I mean your school might not want to see you necessarily as like on par with them, but, but like if you see yourself as a strong individual who's worthy of love, who's worthy of like respect, who's worthy of a humane and learning environment, and if you stand up for yourself and you interact with other people as peers versus like, I don't know, like a short coat kind of have to follow all the rules and do dumb things that don't make sense. You know, like some of this is like you get into victim mentality and then you like never can break out of it. So I would really encourage you like never to fall into victim mentality and to give constructive feedback so that you can just make your school a better place and you can make the learning environment better for yourself and for the people who come after you and just stay completely fixed on your North Star and like align yourself with mentors who are actually practicing medicine the way you hope to practice. Does that help? Great, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yes. I can piggyback off that since I've been through school too. I don't know if you want me to come in. Right? Come back up. Claire has something to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get it on the microphone. It might be easier than me yelling across the room. <laughs> Just talk into my okay. breast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say a big thing that you want to do is keep doing stuff that you love. So. Whatever it is, like why you came in medicine, you know, like I love the preventative stuff. So I love nutrition, I love exercise, I love connecting with people on a deep level, I love like giving my heart, you know. So if you can find stuff to do that, please, like in Lebanon, I dressed up as a carrot and taught elementary school students nutrition. They loved it. Like we did the conga line around mm -hmm. class and we played a bunch of music, and they, I was I was on fire after that. Like I was just like, like call my parents. I'm like, oh my god, I'm so psyched right now, just like <laughs> jumping off the walls. But you want to keep doing stuff that you love through school. It's not like you're chasing, you know, this end goal. And then okay, you know, what is it going to be when I get there? It's continually finding things. It's like this is why I'm here, you know. And then being on rotations for me, I got lucky that I got to do OMT with a first two, you know. But even like I have internal medicine next, and I talked to one of the doctors who I'm now good friends with, um, just because we just had such a good experience. Um, he's like Claire, like on internal medicine, see you know what it's like in there, and if they allow you to treat patients, go in there and go ahead, like find the somatic reflexes, you know, on a cardiac patient, and and it's really and people love to be touched, you know, it's like 
that's a huge thing too, you know, and that's a benefit that we have as you know, an osteopathic school. Is it makes a huge difference. And if they see that you care, you know, you can make so much more of a difference in their lives, just really, really connecting with them. Um, so I think it's I think it's really important to find that where it is the true connection, where it is why you came into school. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but keep finding find those things, make it clear on what you want and what you stand for. Um, and Dr. Junkins calls it your brand, which is perfect because it all lines together, you know? It helps you get into residency, but it's not, it's authentic, you know, and it comes from your heart. So just keep doing that kind of stuff and it just, it really fills you up, it really does. So you make a big difference in people's lives. Yeah, and I'll echo what she said about dressing up like a carrot. I didn't quite go that far, but during um, during my intern year, I think it was, I went and talked to like a bunch of different fourth grade classes about nutrition just on my own. And later on, we had a project to do something with the community, and I just used all the material that I'd already gathered like on my own, having no idea that project was coming up. But I basically took all these different weird like, you know, watermelon daikon radishes and leeks, like the, the basically fruits and vegetables that I thought this like lower demographic um, elementary school like the kids had never seen before and I put them across a table and had everyone eating them and like people were running up to get like dried figs and were like eating you know and I got all these like love letters afterwards because the teachers make the students often I don't know if you got this but <laughs> they make them write these letters to you and um, like I still have them and I still read them and they're so funny they're like this kid said oh my god the figs looked gross but they tasted great and thanks for coming. And even like a kid that was absent that day, the, the teacher made him write a letter. I missed it. I'm so sad. I didn't get to taste the leeks. And the, the way I had them eating raw beets because I told them if they eat enough raw beets, it'll turn their urine red and they'll scare their parents. And they loved it. And they all ran to the front to eat like raw beets. And I mean, stuff that you could never get kids. That's the thing is people always say, oh, people, they won't eat healthy. You know, like drug, oh my God, I went to this like cholesterol sponsored dinner one night and like basically like all the doctors there were like so stuffed with steak and like chocolate mousse that they were like sliding under the table. <laughs> and the guy there was like Lipitor, Lipitor, whatever he was. And everyone's like, yeah, 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 I'll prescribe it tomorrow. And I was like, I was the only one on the edge of my seat raising my hand going, but you know, there's another way, you know, like I'm vegan. And he's like, well, nobody can do that. And all the doctors are like snoring and under the table and, you know, because they're so like tired, right? And then, um, and then, I, what did I share then? Oh gosh, what did I say? But he, the guy leading the talk, by the way, looked just like Homer Simpson. <laughs> he was like a mess. He was like the drug rep guy, right? Or he was the doctor that was like paid by the drug company to come and teach us how to prescribe cholesterol drugs. Anyway, but the point is at, like, of course, people are who are in the business of putting you on cholesterol drugs aren't going to tell you how easy it is to get fourth graders to eat raw beets. But like the fact is, if you go and have a good attitude and share fun stuff that happens with the human body when you eat certain foods and how it makes your urine smell and look. Like kids think that's really cool if you eat asparagus that your urine could smell like asparagus or you, you know, like if you tell kids that they'll run around and eat asparagus and raw beets all day just to, you know, so the point is like you have to make it fun and interesting, you know, and it was around Halloween so it was really fun because they were, but I got all these love letters like, what was another one? Like this, oh, I, I brought my stethoscope and I let them listen to their hearts and stuff. This kid wrote me something I'm like, oh, when I listen to my heart on your stephicate, <laughs> even though I was relaxed, it sounded like a wild horse, you know, and, and it was just really funny. And I can't even recreate what they said. But anyway, it's really fun to like get out of school and go into the community and do stuff that matters to help people with their lives and their health. I think that's what you're saying. Like touch people, go out on your own volition if you have like a free day and see what you can do for kids in the neighborhood or um, how you can teach health, you know? Yeah, go for it. So it, it really sounds like what you're saying is, is don't wait. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't, don't do wait. It. You're a healer now. Don't do it, yeah. Yeah, have, don't wait. You have your, you have your personal statement. Don't wait till you graduate. Yeah, be it. 
Be like, to live your personal statement now. Like, you don't need, you know, look at Patch Adams. He, like, even gave up his medical license. Like, a lot of the stuff he does doesn't even require a medical license. But look how many people he's, you know, he's been in war-torn countries. He's been at refugee camps. He's made, like, kids smile who are, like, near death and starving. And, you know, like, like what is that worth? Like, you don't need a medical degree to do what matters in the world. Yeah, like, it'll help you know what to give for strep throat, and you can do that. You might be able to do that as a naturopath. But, um like you, you can have other degrees too. It's not just you need an MD or DO degree to do what matters in the world. And most of what the world needs now, like you don't need a medical degree to deliver. Most like what we really need now in the world mm -hmm. just requires like your humanity mm -hmm. and not a degree. Mm -hmm. So just already do that. You'll feel really good now. Yeah. I was going to say that it may seem like you feel like you don't have any time to do stuff in the community sometimes. But, but just dressing up like a carrot and wandering through the grocery <laughs> store, you could do that in 30 minutes. <laughs> and we, we had a lesson in an hour. And the thing is, it didn't take very long. I mean, we had to plan out the lesson beforehand, but we had a fixed lesson. And then, you know, after we would do this, and you just, you feel really good, you know? And not that this is the primary thing, but you become a better studier. You become better in school because you now have a purpose through it. You become more efficient. When you're happy, you work better, you know? It's not, it's, I feel like it's hard in, in med school because you have so much information you have to download into your brain. And so it, you become really intellectual, you know? And it's hard to get here because you're so much up here. But you have to do this stuff too, you know? That's why we're here. So just find that stuff that's true to you. and continue to do that. And even the town hall meetings, which sound really like, oh my gosh, it must take a lot to do a town hall meeting. They only took an, took an hour. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do one, like if you want to do something that's really fun, like during med school, then go to a classroom and either do it like a nutrition talk or go ask a bunch of fourth graders what an ideal clinic would look like and have them design their ideal clinic. <laughs> they would love that. They have so many good ideas. They could tell you exactly where to put the scale and where not to put the shots and what to do with the receptionist and whether you even need one and they'll decorate the walls and they want, you know what I I mean, they are so full of ideas. And so if you're thinking, like if any of you are into pediatrics and think you might want to go take care of kids, like start now, collect the data from kids right now in Lebanon and ask them, what do you guys want for an ideal clinic? And then when you do your pediatrics rotation, you could be like, wow, this isn't really measuring up with what the kids told me they want, or maybe it is, you just don't know. But like, we'll never know what we're doing until we put the end user in charge and not just with the like patient centered term. That's such a like overused bad term. Like that's just used to again, control us, you know? Um, so yeah, just go out and be real and do it. And it, you, you can't get to the end user soon. if you're a healer, like you need somebody to work on, you know? And so go do it now. You don't have to prescribe drugs. You could just touch them. Yep. You could just give, share a carrot with them. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's true. <laughs> so any other questions? Well, you guys made it through. Thank you so much. <laughs>